Welcome to Good Journeys with Second Mountain, the podcast that shines a spotlight on inspiring people and their inspired stories. Coming up on this episode... I was devastated at the time. I thought, oh, well, that's it. You know, it's never going to happen. And of course, I just was another step along the journey. And now I always say to any aspiring writer, you know, every no can actually be a stepping stone on the way to yes. If you use that as a way to grow, and it is hard, as the classic adage goes, you know, many successful writers could wallpaper their lounge in rejection letters. Part of any success has many, many failures along the way. And I wouldn't even class it as a failure either. I just class it as a kind of learning, learning opportunity. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Good Journeys with Second Mountain, the podcast series that shines a spotlight on inspiring people and their inspired stories. I'm your host, Ben Veal, founder of Second Mountain Comms, helping good people do good. And joining me today is my very special guest, Rachel Bright. Rachel is a highly accomplished and hugely popular children's author, artist, and creative entrepreneur. Her beloved books, including the Lion Inside series and the Dino Feelings collection, have now sold over 5 million copies worldwide and been translated into an incredible 46 languages. Her best-selling and self-illustrated Love Monster books are now also a major animated series on CBeebies in the UK, HBO Max in the US, and broadcast globally, while the Lion Inside series, which includes The Koala Who Could and The Squirrels Who Squabbled, is now available on Audible, voiced by the one and only Bill Nighy. As a former winner of the World Book Day Illustrator Award, and multiple-time award finalist, Rachel's storytelling career continues to go from strength to strength with the release of new books, The Gecko and the Echo, and The Stompy Saurus. Away from the world of writing, Rachel's also the founder of award-winning stationery and gift brand for Brightside, co-founder of health and wellbeing retreat Happy River, and describes herself as a professional optimist. Rachel, that is probably the longest introduction I've ever done. Thank you for joining me on the Good Journeys pod. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you very much. I'm blushing quietly over here. <laughs> that, that is that is a lot to cram into one life. Well, you know, you've got to make the most of every moment. That's one of my philosophies. And so, yeah, I, I feel like if you're interested, then you're interesting. So I've always, I, I had that said to me once as a young child and I've carried it with me ever since. And I love the variety, you know. I like it. Well, look, this this podcast is all about good journeys, and um, you know, you've obviously been on one heck of a, a roller coaster journey. Um, where did it all begin? Becoming this kind of children's author and illustrator, your path to this journey begin. Well, as with lots of great epic journeys, it wasn't as straightforward, <laughs> or, or indeed in a straight line of any kind. Although I will say that my mum and dad always said that, you know, I was drawing and writing as soon as I could hold a pencil. So I've always had a love of creating, which I think is really common to like all kids really, you know, especially at a young age, you want to make marks and tell stories. And if you get the opportunity to read stories and, and be read too, and I think that's a really powerful thing. And I was lucky to grow up in a house full of books and uh, all our family love to read so I think that's where it really began for me if I really look back and I just carried that with me and whenever I was creative I, I felt lit up I know you'll understand that as a creative person yourself um, yeah. and it was really I mean the schools I went to my brother actually was a child genius of some kind I mean he's doing his second PhD now he's my elder brother so wow. he was very very academic yeah and he had the opportunity to go to a great school which kind of would accommodate his amazing genius at such a young age and I kind of followed in his very big footsteps to the same school so I ended up on quite an academic path actually and I studied I think 15 GCSEs six A levels it was all very academic up to a point but what again all the way through I just loved art and it was always kind of sidelined as a bit of a hobby or a second one if you've got time around all your academic subjects but it was all I wanted to do you know my art teachers were the most inspiring people that I met along the way and that carried me far enough that when I had finished my A-levels I knew what I really wanted to do was was go on to do an art foundation and that's where where I started to really sort of come into doing it all the time you know I got to just be free and play and you know we did illustration photography you know I was always writing alongside but there was a lot of creative mark making and I just loved every second of it and I did my undergrad in graphics so I actually trained as a graphic designer at Kingston University which is an amazing amazing course which I can only describe as 
it's incredibly quirky. There was a very small group of us. It, I never touched a computer until like the final term of my third year. I think I was virtually wow. unemployed actually. When I left. But it was more of a, it was, it was really an exercise in learning to think or kind of unthink the way we thought before and see the, see the world from many different angles. And again, I think that was a very big part of my kind of evolution as a creative thinker um it made me question you know we're famously our tutors would ask us but can you can you do any more with it can you do any more we'd always be like oh we've got me any more question you know <laughs> but actually it pushed us to see the world in many different ways and I I hope I brought that into my writing now but yeah I basically went out into the world uh, with all these thinking skills and not many practical ones <laughs> and um I did manage to get a job as a junior designer and I worked for a company called Smice and Bond Street, which is a very sort of well-to-do stationary house actually in central London. And I was lucky to sort of learn the sort of technical side of the trades, but I actually, I just had this really long commute and from Kingston to central London every day. And as anyone who commutes into London will know, there's a lot of people and not much space. And mm. the way that I escaped that was to go inside my mind, you know, and I started writing on those journeys, even if I was standing up, you know, I'd have my little notebook and, and what came out were children's stories. And I think around about that time when I was about 21, 22, I just... I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. And it took a few more years to actually <laughs> get to yeah. doing it. That's when it all began. And I, st- I found some of those stories, actually, the early, early ones um, that I used to kind of scribble down. And the other day when I was clearing out my old studio and moving into my new one, and it was it was kind of nice. It was like meeting with a, with a, a younger version of myself yeah. or my mind, you know, and I was like, oh, it was there. You know, when you can look back and you can see the breadcrumbs, you know, it was there. What what, what did you think revisiting those, looking back now I, with all your books behind you? Do you know, I've realised how far I've come in terms of, like, honing my craft, I suppose. But I also see the magic in the kind of just the free thinking of it. You know, I wasn't really... I didn't know how to get a book published. I didn't even... I, I just was creating because I wanted to create. I, I had to write it. It was I was writing stuff that was almost asking to be written. I, I, I felt like a conduit for that. And it's very raw and kind of quite bonkers, actually, some of the stuff that I found. There was one story called uh, Mr. Sponge and the Invisible Cupcake, which was quite... <laughs> which still sits in a drawer and hasn't seen hasn't seen the light of day yet but maybe one day you know um so yeah and I think looking back all those every time I did that I was taking one little step towards as we all are where where I am today and it was just for the pure joy of it at the time and and then yeah as of course the next logical step would be I uh, then applied to become an air hostess, which is okay. <laughs> which isn't the most logical step at all. But at the time, I was just wanting to take a gap year, and I hadn't done that um, through university, and I had no funds to do it. And I saw this advert, you know, in between writing on the train, and I applied for it, and I got the job. And and that six weeks later, I was in New York, kind of sitting in my hotel room in New York with lots of time on my hands down route and when I was back home to do more writing. So I got this amazing opportunity then to travel the world as part of my job and continue to kind of write and draw. So this is what I mean about a non-linear path. I was kind of, you know, but I would, when I was down route in New York, you know, I would go and seek out the bookstores and I'd kind of hang around in these famous, you know, really famous bookstores that I'd kind of read about and heard about. And I'd be there kind of looking at these. I remember one book I picked up by a lady called uh, Clay Carmichael. She wrote a book called Used Up There, which I still have. I remember buying it on one of those trips. And it is just the most beautiful paired back story of, of the tale of this this little girl with a teddy bear who's and she's afraid that he's going to get used up because um he's you know she loves him so much and he's afraid that oh. he's going to be used up and one day she she doesn't take him with her and he's devastated yeah you know, he thinks the whole world has ended and that's it he's used up and it turns out that she's gone to make him a little suit to protect him and you know he wears this little red suit and I, and I was just mesmerized by these storytellers that I was coming across on 
at, at the same time as experiencing this wonderful thing of traveling the world. So the two things were kind of always traveling in tandem. And I, I think everyone is a creative person actually at their heart. Maybe some of us somewhere along the line kind of either just pauses or leaves it behind because like this life stuff going on or life takes you in another direction. But I really honestly believe that if you can carve out these little moments to create whatever it is, music, drawings, books, writing, for the joy of it, then who knows where that might eventually end up. You know, I, I always think if you put an idea out into the world, it, it's it's mind-blowing to me that an idea out of my head has ended up in 46 countries in the hands of children thousands of miles away. You know, it's just, it's just a crazy concept to me. But at the end of the day, we're all creators of our own lives and then it has a ripple effect into everybody else's lives around us, you know. So, yeah, I was kind of doing that all the way along this this year and a half experience of traveling the world. And then in my kind of naivety, I was like, oh, I've been every, I'd been everywhere that they flew at that time. And of course, they changed the routes all the time, but I'd been to every destination. I thought, this is the time now I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be a children's author, you know. <laughs> Yeah. And I left my job with no practical plan of how that was going to all come about. And I think I did send my work. I did send my work to one publisher at the time. Um, and I and I got kind of standard thanks, but no thanks letter. Very nice. And I've got a good story about that, actually. OK. Uh, I'll tell at the end, but I got this. I got this letter. We'll circle back. We'll circle back. Remind me if I forget. Um, and I was devastated at the time. I thought, oh, well, that's it. You know, it's never going to happen. And of course, I just was another step along the journey. And now I always say to any aspiring writer, you know, every no can actually be a stepping stone on the way to yes. If you use that as a way to grow, and it is hard, as the classic adage goes, you know, many successful writers could wallpaper their lounge in rejection letters. Part of any success has many, many failures along the way. And I wouldn't even class it as a failure either. I just class it as a kind of learning, learning opportunity. <laughs> um, sure, sure. Yeah, at the time I wasn't, I wasn't there. All right, I thought, oh, maybe this, you know, maybe I'm not good enough, all this kind of stuff. And then I kind of just went into myself again and carried on just creating for the joy of creating again. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to, just going to make things and I will show people when I'm ready to show people and that took me uh, skipping a few steps I moved to Bristol and I was only supposed to be there for six months and I ended up staying for like seven years <laughs> which that city often has, has that effect on people because it yep. is a wonderful and I know you're quite local to, to that to Bristol, area yep. Yep. And it's a real melting pot of like established, amazing artists and creatives and interesting people with people up and coming with brand newbies. And we're all kind of in this soup and there's no there's not such a sort of separation, I guess, between you're doing it, you want to do it, you're thinking about doing it. You know, it's all just interesting, you know, and I, I started doing the arts trails there. So when you can open up, there's this culture of arts trails where you can open up your house and show your work and anybody can come and have a quite often they just want a little nosy inside your house but also they, yeah. <laughs> they get to see some creative work as well and I started doing that when I simultaneously started a master's degree at, in printmaking at the University of West of England and I was in heaven I was only doing it part-time so I was also working in advertising as a writer at the time um, and that was kind of funding my MA and they were very supportive the agency that I was working for but I was just, it was like being back in my playground again, learning all these new skills from like etching and silk screening and lithography. And I started getting up the, the courage again, I guess, to show people what I was doing because it was just fun and I had no expectations really. I was just, I kind of, in my mind, I was like, by the end of this master's, I'd like to have a book published. That was my one kind of focus goal. But I didn't, again, I didn't really know how I was going to go about that. And then I had an exhibition of some of my work in a, in North Bristol, and it just so happened that the uh, like a commissioning editor from Penguin, from Puffin, the children's arm of Penguin Books, was lived around the corner. She came in to look at the exhibition. Um, it was a, an organisation called the Bristol East Side Traders, which was set up by actually a really good friend of mine, and I've stayed in touch with since. And I wasn't even there. I'd gone to pick up a, um, a second-hand car somewhere. <laughs> and my, my very good friend, who's a painter, was sharing my store with me. And when I got back, he said, you know, look what I've got for you. And he had a business card. And it was 
so she had come in and bought a piece of my work. Um, she left her card and said, can you give me a call? I'd really like to see some more of your stuff. And I, That's I amazing. Mean, yeah. It was a, bit a, sm- of a, a small world. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, but, I, but again, looking back, I feel like when you take a step towards your dream, Providence steps towards you. You know, it's, it is kind of lucky, but it's also, I think you have to just put it all out there, show people, you know, do all the things that light you up. And somehow that light that you're shining for yourself creates a path for that, that person or that situation or that circumstance to move a little bit closer towards you. And I think that's what happened. So I got the opportunity to meet her. And again, it wasn't that straightforward. Like I showed her like 10 years worth of work. I don't think she knew what, what she was in for. At the time. <laughs> I sort of turned up with this huge pile of a everything you've ever done. Yeah, including the suspension of the invisible cupcake, probably. And she said, have you got anything else? You know, when I showed all this stuff. And I said, well, it's funny. I did actually, and I had, dream, I had a dream about story a couple of weeks previous. And I said, well, I had this idea. And I described this idea to her and she said, okay, that's the story. And, and she draw, uh, bought this little print of a little girl that I'd drawn, a little etched little girl. And she said, that's the character, that's the story. Go away, do your best and come back to me when you're ready. You know? And so it was an eight month process then of me working on that story. And that became, so I, I made a little mock-up and each time she would say it needs to be a bit better and we'd meet up again and, you know, I would get so nervous every time I was going to meet her and anyway as it turned out I got it together well enough she said right you're ready well, I'm going to take you up to the strand and we're going to pitch this and I was like oh, this is the, the, the big I thought I had been pitching it but then there was like a really big pitch to do um to the commissioner and everything and I went up there and I'll never forget that day I mean a friend of mine made me a special portfolio like hand made a portfolio for me oh. I mean I could not have been more prepared <laughs> you know I, I put everything into that that day and we went up there and that day I was offered a three book deal in in the room where I showed the work and that was really the beginning of everything in terms of children's books for me and I've been doing it ever since <laughs> so, that's incredible and and how many and how many published books have you got to your name now so I'm working on my 32nd one so it will be 32 this year I, if someone had have told me that I would have been saying that you know now I wouldn't have believed it at the time you know I was just one story at a time one book at a time and I guess when you're enjoying something you just you just keep writing and keep drawing and and I and I and I didn't circle back to that story but again this is quite a good one for anybody who just has has a hope or a dream of any kind whether it's writing a book or whatever it might be that sort of rejection slash failure piece you know when I I found that letter the other day and it was signed by the same person who was who I was currently working with as a head of head of sort of commissioning and I was doing a brand new book with. So and I'm sure she has no memory of that and she made absolutely the right decision at the time because I wasn't ready. But what I loved about it was that I was now working with that person who in my many, many years before quite rightly spotted that I wasn't ready but now Mm. she had risen up to this job where she was creating books and commissioning new books and I was working on a new book with her the very same person you know it's like yeah again it's like that sort of beautiful synchronicity there's there's just something really nice in that 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 says look just don't don't give up on the things that you believe in because there will be a divine timing a perfect timing in it all and you just as long as you're doing it for joy that's your main purpose then I think everything else will fall into place maybe not on the timeline that you're kind of hoping for I don't regret a single thing that happened along the way you know I came to it a few years later than I had had the original idea but along the way I I met amazing people I did some fantastic jobs I did some not so fantastic jobs I did all of it you know and I And every single thing is a piece in the puzzle to now, you know. So uh, I remember to circle back to that. It's yeah, and no, thank you. I'm I'm a big believer in you know talking a lot about mountains here, but the the small and the big mountains that you climb along the way, the the valleys you dip into, the heights you climb up to. I think it's all part of a rich journey of life, and every little one has a learning along the way. And if you don't do those slightly unusual jobs, if you don't meet some of those those unusual people along the way, um, yeah. you're, you're only really half a person. And you bring those moments and those encounters with you into the later 
creative projects you do, don't you? Um, exactly. yeah. And, you know, you've now, so you're now at book 32 and counting, which is incredible. <laughs> and, you know, what I love about all of your books and, you know, I said, I said off air, you know, we've, uh, many of your books have been kind of firm family favourites for quite a few years. And I, I love this. There's so many kind of different and wonderful characters that you've got across your books, but there's one theme that really unites them all, which is this, idea of being kind and understanding towards one another and, and being caring so w- when you kind of had that first impetus for an idea to become a, a children's author all those years ago did, did you did you really want to set out to write books that had like strong morals and values behind them or is that just kind of naturally crept in along the way I don't think I ever consciously thought about it and I certainly still don't which sounds odd because I I hear you and everybody says this to me you know somebody asked me just today I was doing some events at some schools across North London and that was really exciting that's kind of like a really cool part of the job as well meeting the very people that you're kind of writing stories for although I try to write the two to 102 I mean picture books I feel occupy in particular picture books occupy this really special space in storytelling which no 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 other type of book does in the same way um Mm. in the sense that they're shared often between an adult and a child so and often they're read aloud as well which is another sort of unique thing to that genre and I think I mean not completely unique because of course poetry and there's lots of other ways that you enjoy words and stories but I think with picture books you revisit them over and over again and there's all these little unique sort of facets to a picture book experience and so in terms of putting a big message in a small package and this idea of connection kindness I mean all of those things are big themes in my work but I think it's because what I love to explore in all my work is these universal truths that connect us all as human beings having an experience in this amazing world and that's as important if you're the person reading the book to your little one or the little one reading your book to you you know it's something that speaks to us all and that's what makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end when I read books you know the ones that I choose often have these enduring kind of messages for one of a better word but just it's a feeling you know it's like yeah. a, I, I feel that it's not just words it's a feeling and also if, it, if you're going to read it many many times which as a parent <laughs> I know you'll understand yeah. and I'm a parent too is if you can still read it and feel like oh something something touched my soul yeah. you know that has always been my big goal is that something in the work will 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 touch someone and they will go away from it very very slightly changed or not changed as such but just they'll take something away from it that that means something and I always said if one per if that happened to one person because of one book that I wrote then then that's been worthwhile and anything else is a bonus so the fact that so many have connected is that's happened with us because I mean this this book I don't know if you can see squirrels who squabbled rather I mean that is that is so worn out now in our house you have to get a second copy I mean I've read that to my to my older son I've read it to my younger son I think there's it's interesting because as you say this idea of a picture book I mean so much of reading I mean I'm a I'm a prolific reader and I, I like to think I've lived many many lives through pages over the years but it's a very solitary thing isn't it it's a it's a wonderful thing that you do for yourself as a reader in terms of the adventures you go on but it is a solo endeavor and then you have these wonderful things like picture books which is as you say a shared experience and there's there's so much emotion wrapped in that in that because I can remember so many times you know reading your books reading certain other kind of books that have been popular with with my boys and I can remember exactly where I was you know what we were doing on that day you know and it's you know they they occupy a very special place probably much like films and you know certain toys in in your kind of household fabric don't they in your child childhood's life really and I never ever take that for granted like I find it a total privilege and the biggest compliment to be included in those precious moments of story time especially in the world we live in today where we're all really busy and and carving out time together is can be a challenge so being part of that in some small way and hearing 
that that copy of your book is dogged and well loved and has been you know a tiny part of that really beautiful fabric of day to day love upon love upon love building up mm -hmm. in that kind of way when and, and anyone that spends time around kids in whatever capacity knows that it's it is it's the little tiny tiny moments that that weave together to form this 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 amazing thing that is the bond that we yeah. create within our families yeah. and the thought of being a thread in that in that great sort of tapestry is really yeah i mean that's the greatest greatest thing ever and and i you know i i have the same thing with my girls you know we story time for me of course is like you know I, they, they weren't going to get away with not having like a million books now no. <laughs> but, um, now they read to me and I read to them too and it's just yeah it is really special time so that means a lot to me to hear that it really does well, my, my son was very confused because I said to him that I was going to be speaking with with the lady who did the squirrels who squabbles. He couldn't quite get his head around it. He thought I was interviewing a, squir a squirrel. And he was, he was, he was quite excited. disappointed that I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't interviewing one of the squirrels. <laughs> That's your next yeah. guest. On. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to see that episode. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, but of course, you know, a really big part of, of your books is, you know, these beautiful illustrations. I know you've had a couple of creative collaborations. Um, the latest book that you've got, The Gecko and the Echo, is your sixth, I believe, collaboration with Jim Field. What's that kind of, obviously, you come from an illustrated background as well, and we'll come on to some of your work in a minute. But what's the key ingredient to getting illustrations just right when it comes to winning over younger and older audiences alike? Oh, there's the million dollar question. It um, is, isn't it? Well, I feel, I feel you've the nailed the formula by now. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think actually there's no one straightforward answer except that the great secret of all things that, or not so secret thing about creations like this is that they're a symphony, never a solo or even a duet. You know, there's, in the case of my partnership with Jim Field, what actually happened, and again, there's some beautiful synchronicity in this story, is I actually had written the lines inside and my agent, who actually was the lady who formerly was the commissioning editor at Patton has become my agent, extremely good friend. She's kind of godmom to my kid. You know, she's, she's a, just an amazing person. And she had read that text and said, I think I know who would love this. <clears throat> and she'd shown it to an editor at Hachette. And they immediately said, I think I know the right person for this story. So they they put us together. And I think there's a, there's a little bit of a misnomer sometimes with people who would love, dearly love to write a text that they somehow have to bring the package of the illustrations and the text together. And, you know, they have to have kind of thought all that through. But actually, there's some amazing, amazing genius kind of masterminds out there who can, who can just put a text with the perfect person or at least approach that person and see if they're interested. And... Um, the funny thing was when they told me they they were going to show this to Jim, I had this memory. It's like my mind immediately went back to two years and I had been doing an event at the um, Discovery Center in Stratford in London. And I had been doing a Love Monster event actually at the time because I was still illustrating all of my own books at that stage. And I hadn't even fathomed that I wouldn't continue to do all my own books you know I just hadn't really thought about it and so I was doing this event at the Discovery Centre and they said to me afterwards oh when all the kids have gone you've got 10 minutes why don't you have a look around downstairs this is an amazing exhibition that, that this talented illustrator has put together and I went down there and it was all on a kind of major Tom theme and all space and I walked around it and I was like, wow. I mean, all of their exhibitions, he's, he's done one that's on there now at the moment, actually, and I'd encourage anyone that's watching this in the right time frame to go and see it because it's really something else. But he, yeah, he created all of these kind of three-dimensional, he'd done the drawings and they'd built them and it was kind of a world inside his imagination. And I was just blown away. I thought, whoever this is, is doing what they were destined to do on this planet you know I just was really yeah. I, that's all I knew but when they said his name I was like oh that's the guy I saw his exhibition and so I was keeping everything crossed that he liked the story and that he was going to say yes to illustrating it really and that was the only the second book and I had at that stage I had never collaborated with another illustrator and seen their illustrations so that book The Line Inside was being illustrated by Jim at the same time as another book called Side by Side was being illustrated by another great hero of my heroine of mine, Debbie Glory, who's done so many amazing books. And I was just like, 
this is going to be really weird when when the illustrations come back because I was so used to doing them myself you know I thought I was going to yeah. be a real control freak I'd be there going no that's not what I was thinking at all you know I was there with my red ready with my red pen and these illustrations illustrations on both counts landed on my desk and I was like oh wow this is there's some magic going on here and I immediately thought this is the beauty of collaborating on anything like this thing has become bigger than than either of us could have created this is the bigger thing that we could have created on our own you know this is like yeah. I was like, again, goosebumps, you know, and I put my red pen away. I was like, oh, I don't seem to have many comments other than wow, you know, because you do get an opportunity to kind of see the roughs and then make suggestions and, you know, then the colours. And I was, I just knew something special was happening. And as it turns out, we've had, again, all these lovely little synchronicities along the way. And I've gotten to know Jim really well now. And he's, been really incredible but we've had these little stories where like the stories have landed in his world at a time when he's experiencing something which made the story speak to him like almost every time we've created a new one together and that relationship's evolved and we now kind of throw ideas around and talk about settings and it's been a journey and I just I really love the fact that I can wear the hat of illustrator and author but I also get to do this thing where a story comes to me and, and, and I get to kind of let it go to someone who then weaves all of these things in that I could never do with my own illustrative style. It's so different. And then I can write in kind of different voices, if that makes sense. And I can imagine different worlds because uh, I have more stories than I can ever fit into my lifetime, certainly than I could ever illustrate it because I'm a really, really slow illustrator, like really slow. I'll do everything in etchings. <laughs> and I mean, I've found the slowest way to illustrate in the world. So I'm kind of really happy that I get to do both things. And that was really on the behest of my great friend and an agent who said, I think you've got too many stories. How would you feel about collaborating? And it was her idea, really. And I'd just become a mum. And I was like, I had less time to just tinker and play with my just my own illustrations. And I thought, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna embrace this. It's been knocking on my door for a while, and I should say yes. And boy, am I glad I did. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Do you find you're um, getting to the point now, whereby when you come up with an idea and you know Jim's going to collaborate with you, are you are you already seeing his illustrations in your mind when you're developing those characters? Do you do you talk through ideas with him at the outset, six books in? It's different every time. So a little insight into so the first time, obviously, I'd already written it. The second time with Kevin the Koala and the Koala who could, um, I could already see, I, I was kind of, it's a bit like I can step into the world visually in my mind because he's so amazing at doing perspective. And so when I'm writing things like Kevin up in the tree, I know he's going to do this incredible, like, yeah, there it is. <laughs> this incredible kind of perspectives of, Kevin looking down from the tree and his friends looking up into the tree. And I can kind of, I'm taking that walk in my mind for sure. And then with squirrels, I actually saw Cyril on Jim's. I kind of sometimes looked at his characters and just, because you get inspiration from different places. Sometimes I see a character and I want to write a story for that character. And that was the case with the squirrels. I, he had this lovely illustration of the squirrel swinging on the swing as he is in that first spread this big pair of glasses on the glasses went but I texted him or emailed and said is that is that squirrel on your uh, website has that already got a story or can I you know can I take him for a ride you know and he was like yeah no I'd love to write I'd love to have a story about that squirrel um and he, it was just a sketch for him and then that became two squirrels and that became squirrels as well so it changes, but now I find myself thinking, so we've kind of traveled the world in our minds and gone to places we would love to go to or have been to. And with the latest one, the Gecko and the Echo, I, I actually was lucky enough to go to Hawaii, which is like a dream trip for me um, about five years ago. And I've been to that canyon where that, that he's drawn uh, so beautifully in the book. And I was able to actually send pictures of the actual canyon and the actual like these little geckos that we saw that over there and I'm kind of thinking simultaneously thinking of the story and the character at the same time as thinking what what rich amazing beautiful environment can I can I give as a gift to illustrate to Jim in the sense that I know that he is so amazing at like just he totally delves into it he researches everything 
he goes to that place in every sense of the world. And I know that if it's exciting to go to a new place in a new environment, then he's going to enjoy that process. And if he's enjoying that process, it's going to, it's going to come out great. And he said that to me. I mean, after squirrels, he said, look, anywhere, Rachel, but no more trees. Okay. Because <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of work in those trees. But every time he does a new book, he just knocks it out of the ballpark. Like, I think it can't get any better. And then I see the next one and I'm like, oh, it just got better. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. It must, must be such a joy to see your work come to life. And, and, and kind of talking of work coming to life, um, Obviously, we're talking a lot about Jim and his his illustration, but before these collaborations, there was Love Monster, and you know your your series Love Monster has now become this you know hugely successful TV and licensing channel in its own right. As I said earlier in the intro, you're here in the UK, you're in the US, it's global now. I can't get the theme tune out of my head, and for that, I don't <laughs> I don't want to thank you for that part. Um, <laughs> What, what, what's the journey been like for you, Rachel, to see that beloved story of yours burst to life on screen? It's hard to put it into words, and I'm a word person, as you know, but it's just, it's like winning the creative lottery like three times over, which never happens. I always wondered what it would be like to see one of my characters kind of walk and talk and do things beyond the page. And it was definitely in my kind of you know dream dream list of things to happen with love monster what's lovely about that is i feel like he ca he came knocking on my brain demanding to be written he was one that came through you know i woke up at five o'clock in the morning with the idea in my head and i could have gone back to sleep thank goodness i didn't i i got up and i literally ran downstairs i've done a little little vimeo film about it that my friend helped me make because it was such a funny it hasn't happened before or since really with a story or a character but I ran down the stairs grabbed a pencil sketched out the whole first book as little thumbnails and the sun just before the sun was coming up you know and there he was and I was like wow that's that all came you know and it, it stayed almost the same obviously it got better and we did the illustration I did all the illustrations in etching and that was really fun I learned the whole new process of solar etching through it but in terms of the story pacing and the very graphic style of there's a pile of kittens and bunnies on one page and we just had a big sort of <laughs> pile of these kittens and bunnies and he's just peeking in from the bottom page and it, it's just I did it in a very graphic way which is how my illustrations kind of have evolved to become you know that's what I love to do is play with composition and stuff but yeah there he was and he stayed the same in that book and I feel like there was a little bit of magic happening that day and that I always I thought it was going to be one book at the time it was just like there's the story there he is you know he's he's written and that's that and then these amazing things started to happen so he he was really like popular over here, um, which was amazing. I mean, it's the first time I'd had a book in the like top 100 and everything. That was really exciting. And then my friend made me, uh, she handmade this love monster, big fluffy love monster for me um, as a like, well done. And, and then as she made me that, I heard that it had gone to number like five in the States when it was released a year later. And all of that basically meant that I could take him on tour. So me and love monster like, went on tour around schools and festivals in the UK. And then I started doing like, you know, virtual things, uh, even back then, you know, uh, with countries around the world. I went to international schools in Amsterdam and Switzerland. He'd love Monster came with me. Wow. You know, he was looking well geared by the end of that. So, and I guess just, I don't know, this whole world got up around him and I got the opportunity to do three more books at the time, which was Love Monster and the Perfect Present and Love Monster and the Last Chocolate and then Love Monster and the Scary Something. Again, I thought, well, that's the four books. That's the collection. And I remember having a thought once when I was out for a run because I'm, I'm a big runner and I, that's kind of my meditation, moving meditation. And I, I thought, I wonder if Love Monster will ever end up on TV. And it was a completely, you know, it wasn't like I had anything to base that thought on. I was just, it was just a thought and I let it go. And sometimes that's the best thing, isn't it? To have that kind of dream, but then also so let it go and just yeah and something amazing happened i came to the bath literary festival um uh, my great friends john mcclay who set up that and his wife who set up that uh john and jill mcclay set up bath literary festival for children and it was just so wonderful i loved that festival and i did it a couple of years but he asked me to come and do love monster and i did and that's when i first met him and we got, got to be quite good friends and latterly he was doing a big tv a search for books that could potentially 
translate into TV. And there were loads, you know, it was like hundreds of really great books that could translate into TV. But Love Monster was in the running because he was aware of it and he put it forward as part of that. And then it went into the process and somehow it made the final two. And it began to be commissioned um, and it was a big production. It was like three co-partners, um, uh, you know, producing it because it's a big undertaking. Like I've never done TV mm. stuff before. It moves fast. Well, it moves really slow and then it moves really fast as soon as it's all happening. Um, and I was literally like, I had to keep checking that I was awake because <laughs> I'd woken up with Love Monster in my head as a dream, but it felt like a dream. I mean, the whole thing quite literally feels still feels like a dream come true because I got to be a creative developer on the show I was involved right from the beginning and it was amazing because I hadn't long had my my daughter was very small and I was pregnant with my other daughter and they all came to where I live and we did the first production brainstorm in one of our cabins where we live and we came up with the world beyond because of course you've got your picture book and you've got your world and it was called Cubesville in the books it's actually called Fluffy Town on the on the tv show but you know you have to work out oh what happens what happens like beyond the page you know like and who are the other characters what do they do and 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 it was so much fun coming up and I got to be part of that coming up with new characters like his best friend Tiny is Fluffy is funny and then there's Bad Idea Puppy. He's one of my favorite characters on the show <laughs> um, because he's he's that friend that will like see the line you shouldn't cross and run over it screaming, follow me. You know, he's, yep. he's that one. And we all need one of those in our lives <laughs> to yeah. kind of break out of our comfort zones. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it was just, I and I look at it now and it's over 100 episodes and I got to write some episodes for the show. I was very much out of my comfort zone. I, I waited until we were sort of 50 episodes in and I'd been kind of reading them and commenting on them and, and kind of helping to springboard ideas. And then I was like, could I have a go at writing one of these scripts? And they were amazing. They let me kind of have a stab at it. And sure enough, like five episodes I've written for the, the show overall. And, and that was, I mean, the whole thing was just an utter like thrill. I like, I can't begin to tell you how much I love seeing it. And more than that, I love seeing like kids enjoying it. And sorry about this about that theme tune being an earworm at the, the genius that wrote that <laughs> he is a real genius like I as soon as I heard it and I got to help with the lyric a little bit and yeah it is a bit of an earworm but that's the whole point all that you know all the best shows have have earworm theme tunes <laughs> I can think of a few <laughs> yeah, absolutely so Love Monster um of course isn't your only book to receive the star treatment and you've recently had um Bill Nighy recording um versions of the vocals of the line inside um what, what was it like having such a kind of renowned thespian reading out your your words? Are you kind of used to this now with, with Love Monster? You never, you never, ever get used to it, I think is the answer to that. He was on my wish list and everyone told me, oh, he's probably going to be busy. And, you know, but I was like, we're going to ask, you know, because I'm a big fan. Yeah, he said yes. You know, sometimes the stars align. I was really thrilled. Again, it's another pinch me moment. I just think he's great. And he brings a real the blend of like the comedy that he has the way he delivers things but also he's so familiar you know every, you, you feel you know him so I think again that's a really wonderful thing with reading the picture books and he's just he's just done a really great job I, I hope you enjoyed that I said he's got, yeah he's got a very comforting voice hasn't he there's something about yeah. him that's very reassuring in his tone exactly and and the fact that it's actually all happened because a lot of these things you know you get to put forward your ideas and who you'd like and everything but it doesn't necessarily people are busy and that especially people like Bill Nye, you know, it's like they're going to be busy with lots of projects. The fact that there was a little space just at the right time and he was available to do it was really wonderful. And both me and Jim said, you know, we let out a little a little squeak or a little roar when we found out he's going to be reading the line inside. So happy dances all around, that's for sure. Yeah, but I, I remember seeing you announce on social media and I could tell you were, you were very, very happy. Yeah, I was a bit fangirly, I must say. But um, I think I think that's I think that's very very understandable when you have when you have kind of a Hollywood A list of reading out your books. Yeah, exactly, cool. exactly. Yeah. Um, so the other the other series I want to talk about was the the Dino Feeling series. So I can see just tucked away there. I think that's the yeah. which one is that there? Is that the one's that. Hugosaurus. Oh, the, the Hugosaurus. Yeah. So you've got you've got the Hugosaurus, the Stompysaurus, and what's um, the other? So Worrysaurus. Worrysaurus was the first one. Then Hugosaurus, then Stompysaurus. And then there's a new one 
coming out this year in um, I think September time, which is which is called the Wobbly Saurus. So that one's coming out but, uh, quite soon, and there are more um, in escrow. So our whole little dino dino world is growing. <laughs> Amazing. So these are illustrated with Chris Chatterton. You know, you're confronting some very very big emotions here for a younger audience. Has that, has that kind of been important to you? That that feeling of being able to help children to understand their feelings more fully, especially you know writing these after you've had your your daughters definitely i think childhood in particular but just life is a bit of a navigation of our whole spectrum of emotions and what i feel very strongly about is there is sort of no bad emotion you know there's no emotion that you shouldn't feel basically because they're all valid they all come upon us we've all felt angry we've all felt sad we've all felt anxious and it's almost like often there's this temptation to sort of plonk those in the bad bucket and then you're happy and you're excited in the good bucket and I think less so nowadays which is really refreshing actually because there's a there's a really healthy conversation around our emotions being our friends actually and they're your guidance system we're all somewhere on that spectrum of emotions at any given time and it's I think having the tools to know what brings you as an individual back into up the emotional spectrum or, or perhaps not, perhaps you just need to sit in that emotion for a while until you're ready to move out of it. And kind of allowing them is actually, it's kind of a new idea for me in the last few years. You know, I've kind of gone on my own journey with that. And I I kind of love the idea that we can open these conversations with children who are who are open, they're naturally open and vulnerable and they show their emotions. You know, when a little one's having a tantrum, like Stompysaurus or whatever, quite often us grown-ups are having one of those inside mm. that it's socially unacceptable to kind of show it on the outside. And yeah, do you know what? I'm 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 sometimes I'm quite envious of my four-year-old because you know, <laughs> he he can literally scream the house down, red in the face, not coming out of his nose, you know, just <laughs> But, but he gets us out of the system, get two or three yeah. minutes and it's done. And he's happy yeah. and he's playing Lego again. And sometimes I just wish I could do the same. Exactly, exactly. And I think often, again, where I say the picture book occupies the space of grown up with child, this is as much about a conversation together about how we navigate those emotions as a family or as a community or whatever. And, and kind of being okay with the fact that sometimes you're not okay you know but one thing we don't necessarily have control of is the things that are happening around us but what we always can have control of if we nurture it and look after it is our perspective upon that and this is kind of what I tried to explore in the Worrysaurus and the Hagosaurus and the Stomposaurus and, and, and all of them really is that in the moment, it can be hard to recenter and go, oh, hang on, hang on, back up, back up. I could see this from another perspective. You know, there could be an opportunity in the middle of this problem. Or I maybe if, uh, like in the Stompy Saurus, you know, he stubs his toe and the whole thing, the whole, we've all had days like that, right? Something goes wrong and then it just spirals and you're like, oh, I'm having one of those days. Yep. <laughs> but actually- Do you know, I was having one of well, having one of those days today, which is why I'm so pleased I'm ending my day speaking with you <laughs> because you just have those days sometimes where it's just everything is going wrong in a day. Totally. And, um, and again, that's kind of normal and natural and it's okay. And like, there's this tendency to hide those things away and the kind of shiny social media and all that kind of thing. But actually, when we're open and honest about it, it's kind of unifying because you're like, oh, you you feel that too. And here's my way of dealing with it. And, here's, and it's kind of like what I'd like to create is like this little toolbox of ideas. And not every idea is going to be the right idea for every person. But for instance, in the Worrysaurus, it's about finding language to talk about a, a physical feeling you know of, of worry or anxiety so that feeling of butterflies in your tummy and I really loved the metaphor of kind of setting that feeling free and I think that's something again we can all identify with no matter our age um, but for children they might not say I'm worried it's not it doesn't come out in that language necessarily it, it's a feeling or it's an action or it's a, it's it's something that you explore and you experience and explore in a different way as a kid and as you say it comes and it goes and they let go of it and they're very good at processing in that way certainly when I was growing up there was a bit more of a culture of oh stop crying you know put, <laughs> you know uh, you'll be fine kind of thing you know and that's that's okay and resilience and it is a good thing too but I just think perspective 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 and if you know that you can just when you're ready stop look at it from another angle and go <clears throat> do you know what that 
that thing that I feel awful about, maybe it's not so awful after all. You know, when I talked about my letter, <clears throat> my rejection letter, you know, the world felt like it was falling apart. When I looked at it from a different angle and I can look at it from a different perspective now, it was an amazing opportunity to get better <laughs> as a writer and to take my next step on the journey, you know. So you, that's the one thing we always have control of is our choice of how we choose to view something that's happening to us you know um, so that's my big idea in the books and to be honest it's been such a joy to work with Chris as well because when we wrote The Worry Saurus that was a real example of collaboration from the very beginning because he had that sketch of um, the little worry saurus before the story existed so they showed me that little sketch and they said would you like to write a story around the idea of this character so it was like his magic of creating that little character sitting on a rock looking kind of downcast, you know, and I was like, I immediately wanted to know about that character. and wanted to write a story about a worry source. And that's how that book came about. And again, we didn't know it was going to be more than one, but then we had this idea, do you know what? There's something in this exploring all the different pole spectrum of feelings. And it, it's really fun. Like I'm really enjoying it. And every time Chris illustrates, like all great illustrators, they put stories within the stories so I get his pictures for the worry saurus and there's like 10 dinosaurs and a little platypus and something else and I'm like oh god I want to write a story about that little mammoth family and that dinosaur over there and you know you kind of want to walk around in the worlds that he's created and so yeah it's endless you know I feel like there'll be hopefully lots of more little dinosaurs and lots more feelings to explore within it <laughs> i hope so and i i know that i know that feelings are a big thing to you because you you describe yourself i mean you've got this whole other strand to your entrepreneurial world which is the, the bright side collection of optimistic gifts and and stationery i know that you describe yourself as a a professional optimist or a is that is that the right term an eternal optimist i mean uh, what, what? i am an optimist although my new one I'm I'm an internal optimist, a possibilitarian, and an enthusiastic human. I feel that's my main, main three jobs in life. And, well, I love um, it. So, so go on then. This is this is the biggest question. Well, what's what is the secret to having an optimistic outlook on life? I think again, what I touched on, it's it's perspective. It's being able to go. Here's my problem. What feels like a problem, I know that somewhere in the middle of all of this is, is there's a kernel of opportunity. I've been quite blessed with a sunny disposition, even from growing up. And my, and my dad's very much like that too. He's a natural optimist. I'm always searching for that beam of sunshine. It sounds trite, but it's like it is that kind of silver lining on the cloud. You know, I'm much more likely to focus on that. And so I've just brought it into my work. And with the cards and the gifts, that all happened so organically because I was just printing things in the studio. I think I might have even been, I can't remember what I was doing, but I was printing something about someone that I felt a lot of love for. And I wrote and I printed out with this hand, you know, the old letterpress blocks. And I printed yeah. out you know, my heart go boom. And I was hand printing each letter by letter. Again, found the slowest way to do anything and did it that way <laughs> and I was just printing it out just because I was I was feeling it you know I was like oh I was just printing it. I had no purpose for it at the time other than I just wanted to do it and someone wandered past and said oh that'd make a good valentine's card and I thought oh yeah that, that would make a good valentine's card and I showed it on the arts trails in Bristol people kept buying that print and saying things to me like, oh, you just put into words, like you put something really cool into words, like you've articulated something that I feel about someone. All my best ideas came from when I was actually thinking about stuff. So when I was sending, I used to, have to make handmade birthday cards and send them to a friend. And another original line was, you know, can you can you stop being so brilliant, please? You're showing the rest of us up. And I was, I was, that was a real card that I sent to my friend Billy, who I'm great friends with still now, you know, because it was really annoying how how great he was being at, at everything he was doing and we were all like oh Billy you're just so good at everything you know and I kind of wanted to put that sentiment into a card it was yeah, like we lovely. love you you're showing us all up but we love you for it you know so yeah all of my lines came from kind of real feelings I had like five ideas I mean I literally printed out five cards and again I wandered into a card shop and I picked up some cards that I really loved I thought, oh, I'll, I'll look on the back to see who publishes these. And I literally sent my work off in an envelope to them. <laughs> so, you know, again, I don't even know if that's how it worked. I was just like, hey, guys, I came up with these few ideas, you know. 
and he also rejected me. Um, he, he sent me a letter saying, you know, we've already got some big word cards. Um, and it was like typed out standard letter that he'd handwritten in biro. I really love two of these. And I like that you make my heart go boom and the other one. And I sat there, I remember sitting there so clearly, sitting there at the bottom of my stairs, staring at this letter thinking, well, that's a maybe. That's not mm. a no, that's a maybe. He's written. So therein lies the perspective. Because I think I could have just thought, oh, they rejected me. I'll go and do something else. But I was like, I saw the biro rather than the type letter, if that made sense. And I sort of trained my brain to always look for the biro instead of the type letter or the sun instead of the cloud. It's just like a way of being, I suppose. And the more you do it, the more it just it just feels like a natural way to be. And so, yeah, I, I basically bombarded them with loads more ideas until they said yes. And then <laughs> and then he did say yes. And he said, look, I've had enough of you. I think we should just do a range of cards and see how it goes. So you, you essentially love bombed them, Rachel, until they... I did. I love... <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think I did, actually. And he, he said, at the, in the end, he said to me, he did say to me quite recently, sadly, is no longer with us, the guy who I developed all of that with. And we were, again, became great, great friends, 15 years of creating together. He, he did say to me later on, he said, you know, to be honest, I wasn't that bothered about the cards. I just wanted to work with you. You know, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> That was a great compliment to me. But it started with 14 cards. And he, I remember him saying to me, don't get too excited. This is just, this will probably last a year or two and it'll be a fun project and that'll be that. And feel 14 cards became 28, became 100, became 200. I mean, I think we've, we've done over a thousand different designs to date. 15 million cards were sent. I, I love the idea that 15 million nice thoughts were sent by someone to someone else. And the gifts came about very organically. We just, if an idea came up in a meeting, we would have these breakfast meetings and they would turn into lunch and dinner and we'd be like laughing our way through silly ideas. And some of them would fly, you know, I had an idea for a teapot that just said liquid happiness on it. He was like, oh, I have to make that teapot. He didn't like my hammock ideas. I never got the hammock made, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he said yes to a lot of things. And we just said, as long as it's fun, we'll do it. When it stops being fun, we won't. And, and that was the bright side, basically. And it's still going kind of strong, you know, 16, 17 years later. And it's gone through lots of different iterations. And I'm lucky to work with several different companies now. Again, I can hardly believe the ideas from my brain ended up in so many different places. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm curious, did you, did you see a surge in popularity during the lockdowns? For, for you know, Right side began in that in the great 2008 crap, you know, recession when everything was pretty tough. And I think like little bite sized bits of sunshine are like kind of what we all need in different ways, you know, and I've, everyone finds them in different things. But yeah, I, I started, I kind of started revisiting a, a few, some of the bright side bits of obscuring lockdown. Even just when you see a little image or you see a quote or you see something that you can send on to a friend. I feel like the ripple effect is the most powerful thing where if you see something that lights you up and then you send it on and that gets sent on, sent on, sent on. That's what I wish for it, you know, and I, I don't know, to be honest, about whether it whether it was magnified in lockdown. But one thing I do know is that a lot of stories were shared. I I, I started to sort of do things on Instagram during lockdown, as a lot of people did, you know, they're sort of interacting online because we couldn't be in person. And that was like this quite a magical thing to me that there are all these connections being built that didn't exist before it's like the human spirit will find a way to connect even when lots of modes the ways we want to connect to shut down there are still find a way and that was really mm. beautiful yeah i think lockdown lockdown showed us how unbelievably resilient human beings are yeah. lessons learned during that time of that, that kind of first lockdown in in many regards a very special time in its yeah. surreal uncertainty an awfulness very very bizarre time as if all of the stuff we've discussed wasn't enough you've also now got this latest project happy river which is your kind of health and health and wellness retreat and i know that kind of linked to that is this kind of you're you're kind of powered by plants so plant-based living is, is is very important to you rachel so you know what's happy river what 
what what is this venture and what's the purpose that lies behind it? I do like to wear many hats, but one of my great passions is empowerment in, in its many different forms. And I started to get really, really, I've always been interested in health. You know, I'm, I wouldn't describe myself as a health nut, but, you know, I used to be an ultra runner. I've always kind of kept fit and I love to be outside in nature. And I believe these things kind of keep make us uh, help us to thrive rather than just survive. You know, there's a kind of, like there's a spectrum of emotions, there's a spectrum of being. And on one end is survival and on the other end is, you know, being a, a thrivalist, I suppose, rather than a survivalist. And I've been interested about all the different modalities and ways that you can find that thriving because it's different for everyone, but there are some big places where it overlaps. And when I became a mum, I was, I think I was already vegetarian at that stage. I had been vegetarian for a really long time since I lived in Bristol and but my daughter, you know, had a milk allergy. And so she couldn't, I, so through that journey, I gave up um, the dairy side of things and I started to read about it. I mean, I'm a very information hungry person. I love to read. I love to learn about new things. And I started to, uh, it, when I gave up the dairy, it was like night and day. She was, she was just thriving again, you know? And so I wanted to know why, you know, and I dived into that and I started to learn about, diet, health, nutrition, moving your body, breath work, meditation, like all these things that I'd kind of been aware of, but hadn't really like engaged in, you know, I'd, I'd done my, my running, just start running and not stop for like 50 miles. You know, that was my kind of way of, of moving my body. And I didn't have any sense of balance. You know, I, I always joke that my TED lecture will be you know, I used to think balance was boring until I almost went blind in one eye, which actually did happen to me. As a parent, I'm discovering, that's another story for another time, but yeah. now as a parent, <laughs> I'm discovering the importance of balance and how that balance is subtly different in every person. But basically, I started to discover, you know, these amazing people like uh, Rich Roll was one of them who I came across because he's an, he's an he's an ultra runner and he wrote this book called finding ultra and he's plant-based and some of the philosophies around it i read colin t campbell and his book whole which is all about because more than just being plant powered i'm talking whole food plant powered so the idea that nature presents food to us in its perfect form the first chapter of his book is is describing in, in great detail what happens when you bite into an apple and the and the absolutely magical kind of synergistic things that happen with you, the enzymes in your mouth and the fiber in the apple and the perfect balance of fiber and sugar. And to lots of people, this would be like, oh, that's yeah. kind of, but to me, it's like, it's really interesting. And through this process, we always knew we wanted to do something, um, set up a, a place or a project that would help people to be empowered in their own lives and their own health journeys. And I started to read about people who had quite literally radically transformed their their lives and their health through relatively small lifestyle changes you know sometimes big lifestyle changes depending on where you are and we were like wow we have to like get this like get this out there and get all these practitioners who are doing all this amazing work together in a space and you know we want to create that space I mean we're generalists like we're interested in everything because I believe health is a corridor with many many doors and there'll be different doors for everyone, but we wanted to create that corridor with as many doors as possible so that you could come to Happy River and you could open a few doors and you'll find your door, you know, the one that will change something for you. Will, you know, it might be nutrition, it might be diet, but if you have the best diet in the world, but you have some trauma that you haven't kind of dealt with, then are you thriving? You know, maybe you could find something will help you deal with some trauma. You know, I, I did some really amazing breath work with a practitioner who um, has come to our space and boy is that something else I would recommend that definitely I'm always love to try things out so yeah Happy River is basically home to many many talented individuals who come to use the space bring their specialism and groups of people gather hopefully go on a transformative journey so we're, we're, it's a very, very early days. So we've kind of just about, it's been a sort of three year project building it. It was converting a big sort of barn building and we've got a nutrition kitchen downstairs and a kind of underfloor heated sort of area where people lie on the floor and do, do various things, yoga, sound bowl healing, you know, whatever it is. And we've got a yurt um, where people also gather and upstairs, which is kind of my 
I suppose my comfort zone is a big uh, printmaking studio, a kind of creative studio, which will hopefully be a hub for about 30 artists. Also will be the kind of magic sparkle dust on the health, uh, the bit that you're not expecting. When you come to a health retreat, you know you're going to be thinking about your body and your what you put in it and how you move it and yoga and meditation and food. But I believe that what you put in your mind is as important as what you put in your body. And being creative is one of the ways in which we thrive, you know, and that brings me right back to the beginning of where we began actually is creating just purely for the joy of creating is something that not all of us have the space in our lives or to do, but I, I want that to be part of the whole big picture. So we're hoping that's the kind of unique thing about happy river that you'll come and you'll get all of these and you might visit once or many times, maybe you'll visit virtually. Some people may just connect with us, you know, online. And we're hoping to put out lots of ideas and content on, in that way as well as in person. But there might be just that one little thing that that speaks to you and helps you to take the next step on your journey, you know. So uh, sounds, that was a long answer to a short no, question. No, so, sounds incredible. I can't wait to pay it a visit. It so, sounds amazing, Rachel. It really does. And I think, you know, what you... You're describing kind of what you've built in terms of stages. You haven't gone immediately with, you know, we're going to build this huge retreat. We're going to build it up slowly and we're going to we're going to work with practitioners and we're going to bring in these learnings. I just think it it sounds like a you know, it's a real lifestyle purpose based project, isn't it, for, for you? And um, sounds fantastic. Yeah, I'm most excited about all the people we'll meet, you know. Mm. I think building up a community of of people who have these specialisms is like it's like an interconnected, it's the interconnected web, you know, we can create more together than we could ever create on our own. And really, I suppose through this conversation, I'm realizing that's a, quite a theme. And although yeah. they seem quite disparate things that we're doing, it's definitely one ribbon that ties them all together, for sure. It's all connection, isn't it? Yeah. Well, well, look, my, my very last question is, you know, this is this is probably the tough one, but you know, for anyone that's listening today or watching with aspirations of becoming a writer or an illustrator, um, you know, particularly within within the hugely competitive world of of children's literature, is there any advice that you would give someone in terms of getting started on their journey in the right way? Oh, I have some top three, I suppose, that I would choose because I have many things that I could say about that. But and I've touched on many of them along along this conversation. But I would say, write, draw, whatever it is, do it every day, a little bit, even if it's ten minutes, five minutes. You know, sometimes we're fitting these things around our kind of you know day to day life because it's a dream that we're harboring around it. But keep doing it every single day. It's a craft to be honed like anything else. And most of all, hold the belief that it can be you. You know, um, you're already doing it, actually. I mean, what is the difference really between what you're already doing now, creating something in the world, and there's just a few more people seeing it further down the line, you know, and that's where we want to be is like we want to show our work and have it touch the most people possible. But you're already doing it. That would be the big message, really. And the the people who are connecting with your work will naturally grow. Having the courage to show people is where it all started for me. So show as many people as you can. Don't worry about the people that say it's not for them because you'll, you know, if you try to be something to everybody, you'll end up being nothing to nobody. You know, you, you will, your work will be the right thing for the right person. And it's just a question of showing lots of people until you find that person, you know? And um, so, yeah, I, I would say keep writing, keep drawing every single day and hold the faith that if it's meant to be, it will be. Um, keep taking a step towards providence and it'll step towards you. And keep being optimistic. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. Well, look, th thank you so much for all of your time. So it's been, it's been wonderful talking to you. I, you know, congratulations on all of your success and your ongoing success. And I wish you nothing but more and more of it and i'm sure there's more to come where can our audience keep up to date with you on on the web and the social world i try to keep it simple i'm rachel bright books uk i'm rachel bright books on instagram i think i'm our bright books on twitter and um i'm hoping that i'm going to grow into some of the other channels but it'll always be rachel bright books so if you want to find me anywhere really on Amazon or Waterstones or any of those great places, then just Google Rachel Bright Books and hopefully I'll pop up there somewhere. <laughs> brilliant well do check out rachel's brilliant work and um yeah again thank you so much for today's conversation i hope everyone that's been listening today it's left you feeling a little bit more optimistic about the state of the world because it certainly has me 
So thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much, Ben. What a pleasure. If you've enjoyed today's show, then please share it with others and let us know what you think using the hashtag GoodJourneysPod. All past episodes so far of the show are available via Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, YouTube, Google Podcasts, everywhere really. Just use the hashtag to find them. So that is it for another episode of the Good Journeys Pod. Thanks so much for joining us today. This has been the Good Journeys with Second Mountain Podcast. So until next time, let's keep climbing together. I'll see you all again soon.